University of Maryland. To a documentary photographer, every presidency has defining stories, and those images are often how we remember a president. For Johnson, it was civil rights and Vietnam. Reagan is forever tied to the end of the Cold War. Clinton had Middle East peace. History has yet to define the Obama administration. Today, he's pursuing a major legislative goal, health care reform. With the first vote on the health care bill expected in the next two months, the president is already working the phones. You know, some of you remember during the campaign, we had a slogan, fired up. There we go. Not everybody here knows how this story came about. So I'm going to tell it again. A fired up story. This will get the crowd going. Because it bears on health care reform. Pete has covered hundreds of the president's speeches, so the challenge is keeping it fresh. You know, in a lot of ways, the, uh, the, the faces of these people really tell the story. And I think it tells you more about him than a picture of him at the podium. And if it, a voice can change a room, it can change a city. And if it can change a city, it can change a state. It can change a state, it can change a nation. If it can change a nation, it can change the world. So I want to know, are you fired up? Ready to go? Let's go change the world. Thank you, everybody. Today, President Obama is heading to New York City to make a speech on Wall Street. And if the president is flying to New York, so is Pete Sousa. Few Americans ever get to ride on Air Force One, but Pete is one of its most frequent flyers. This is actually his second tour of duty. Pete also served as a presidential photographer during the Reagan administration in the 1980s. Air Force One has a crew of 26 and space for 76 passengers. Secret Service, military, press corps, senior staff, medical crew, and guests of the president. Pete always has the same reserved seat and, like most staffers, is on the plane before the president's helicopter has even left the White House. Attention on board the aircraft. The president has departed with a seven-minute flight time. Pete has already made more than 150 trips on Air Force One and knows nearly every inch of the We're plane's right 4,000 square feet. So this is the uh, conference room. And um, anytime the president's going to have a meeting with some of his aides, this is usually where they meet. So this is the, the guest cabin. On the flight back, you'll see um, probably all the congressmen uh, from New York will be on this flight. And then we'll go back. This is all uh, the, the press pool, where the press pool sits. Um, so they should be boarding the plane momentarily. A few minutes later, Marine One arrives. The president is the last to board. Except, of course, for Pete. For Sousa, Air Force One is the ultimate backdrop to the president's story. But for one presidential photographer on September 11, 2001, the plane became an essential part of the story. 9-11 is a good example of of, of why uh, there's a White House photographer around.
I'd gone to uh, the classroom to talk about reading, and Andy Card came in and whispered in my ear, a second plane has hit the World Trade Center. America's under attack. And at that moment, I knew it was going to be a very historic day. I tried to, to document every moment of that day. Within the hour, the Secret Service evacuated the president to Air Force One. There were some days where I truly felt invisible, just a handful of days during the, my eight years, and that was a day that I truly felt invisible. I could stand just inches from the president and make pictures, and he would look right through me. It was almost like I wasn't even there. Those first few moments on the plane were very intense because it was all about the physical safety of the president. As we flew across the country, heading away from what the Secret Service thought was danger, that would be Washington. Much against my wishes, I want you to know. Uh, I would see flickers on the TV screen of the damage in New York City. And I remember seeing people atop the building that prior to them collapsing and thinking about the agony and horror. The eeriest moment was when the president stepped out of the cabin and he said, I heard that Angel is the next target. There was a, a caller that called in with the Air Force One uh, code name, Angel. He said, Angel is next. And so they, at this point in time, people were, take, were taking every threat incredibly seriously. It, to me, personally, was like documenting a nightmare. As we approached Washington, everyone started saying, oh, look, the, the fighter jets. Are, are flying with us. And so everyone wanted to get a look out the windows. And, and the jets, I mean, they're so close, you can see basically the, the, the whites of the eyes of the pilots. And then looking across the horizon, you can see the smoke rising from the Pentagon. And at that moment, it truly felt like a war. Covering the crisis left Drapel little time to process what had happened. For him, the camera served as a kind of shield, absorbing emotion so he didn't have to. I don't think I really digested in my mind everything. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, I mean, using the camera as a distraction <laughs> worked for me. About eight years later, President Obama arrives at New York's JFK airport and boards Marine One for the trip into Manhattan. Staff, press, and an elite Secret Service team will follow in three other choppers. The convoy of helicopters reaches Lower Manhattan in about 15 minutes. From here, the president will go to the financial district by motorcade. He'll travel inside his state-of-the-art limousine, known as the Beast. Though Secret Service is not at liberty to disclose the limo's security measures, it's safe to say that while it looks like a Cadillac, it's really a kind of shiny tank. The trip to Federal Hall, only a few blocks away, has taken weeks to plan. It involves hundreds of police officers and Secret Service agents, alternate routes, and contingency plans. Pete often rides in the spare limo right near the president. But when he rides several cars back, like today, he has to run or risk missing a shot. Part of my job is, in addition to, to doing the historical documentation, is 
doing the handshake photos. So for instance, the president goes to New York on a trip, there's always greeters at every event that he goes to. And those pictures are really important to the people in the pictures. And so you, you want to make sure you get those in focus, you know, well exposed. And that memento for them is a big deal. Thank you. Of the roughly eight to 20,000 photos Pete and his staff make each week, as many as 5% are greeting shots. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Okay, right here, right here, sir. So many people help the White House on trips like these. Offering them a photograph is a way of saying thanks. Oh, gotta switch cameras here. Oh. Oh, sorry about that, sir. Yep, just gonna switch. Uh, I took too many pictures of the speech. He he caught me in an embarrassing moment. Where it's like that that never happens to me. Sorry about that. That's a, yeah, that's a little embarrassing. Right? It, for, uh, uh, man, I tell you, geographic yeah. in some way. So the camera broke down. Golly. I feel the He's disc. Originally much better than this, I promise. <laughs> Remember, you got to take the lens cap off. No, it wasn't the, the lens, lens cap. The lens cap is important. No, no, no. It was the, I filled the disc. I mean, the speech was so exciting was, that I filled the disc <laughs> with. <laughs> All right, are we ready to go? Before heading back to Washington, the president is meeting former President Clinton for lunch in Greenwich Village. The group that travels with the president spends so much time together, they've become like family. I think the, the great thing about this administration is all these people that go on all these trips, you know, everybody gets along. I was gonna write in spare. In fact, they show their love by mercilessly kidding Pete. They love him in New York City. It's crazy. You see all these they love them everywhere. They, that's why they bring their cameras out. Can you imagine if we announce where we're going? So wait, who, who the chair the chair for Pete Souza. Pete, Pete, Pete. Hello, Pete Souza. Trip director Marvin Nicholson and press secretary Robert Gibbs seldom miss an opportunity to rib him. Whenever we travel with Pete, it's always like this. It's really weird. You see all the bike rack up to make sure that people don't rush the van uh, just to try to touch Pete. Oh, God. What that sign say? I love Pete. Nice. Yes, Pete can. Yes, Pete can. For the president, the lunch with former President Clinton will be a chance to talk with one of the few people who understand the pressures that come with this office. Powerful candidates are by definition revealing. They give us hints about inner workings, but leave room for imagination about who the subject is or how they're motivated. A still photograph is extraordinarily powerful. The amount of information that can be in it, the way it can connect to the individual viewer. My approach to the whole thing was to not intrude on the history, to capture it in a way that people could have a sense, and not to feel that it was being manipulated. It wasn't posed. It was natural and candid. During the Clinton administration, candid images were shot on film. Today, Pete shoots only digital. Pete and his team produce between 20 and 80,000 photos each month. White House photo editor Alice Cabrina looks at every single one. We care about creating this serious documentary archive. We have the opportunity to create, if we want to, the best archive of any 
president that's ever 